Okay, so hi everyone. We are welcoming Tega Brain today as a guest, and um, this is part of a webinar series. And I think it's the only maybe positive thing about the COVID situation is that this our school is totally open for new formats and uh, new forms of inviting guests. So I'm really happy that we can have Tega here with us, even though it's kind of at distance. And but she's calling in live from Brooklyn, New York. And um, well, I think uh, the, the relevance to our course is that her profile is uh, quite an interesting one, or at least for my taste, she has a really an interesting background and the mix of kind of speculative design approaches mixed with, let's say, um, eccentric engineering and uh, has also very much of a hands-on approach. So the, the, the projects uh, she's doing, they're really, I mean, they're, they have a real implication on the world and they work with real data. So, and I think, and she also has this, um, this other side of like publishing articles and really reflecting about her work and the work of others, which I find is a very, very interesting hybrid kind of uh, personality and that's I think that's why we I'm totally happy to have her here and we're gonna spend this afternoon or this morning in Tega's case uh, yeah all together with a couple of activities so I just gonna give the word now to Tega hi warm welcome the zoom applause yeah um yeah, no, so nice to so nice to um, see you all and hear a little bit about what you're doing in your program. It sounds really great. Um, it is nice that, yeah, this COVID year means that we are sort of able to hang out and do more things across oceans, which has been a weird plus for me too. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll just jump in. Um, so I'm going to, and we're going to do three things today. So first of all, and all of uh, this whole workshop is going to focus on um, real time web and this idea of like experimental communication remotely. So I know you've been looking a little bit at sockets and express and node servers. So it's going to build on some of that work. Um, and, and think about some case studies and like why this why this is interesting. What are some precedents in art and design of artists who have sort of explored these kinds of technologies and these kinds of approaches. Um, and I mean, I think it's also a super interesting topic this year as well, right, where like so much of our interaction is happening through these um, modes. Um, we could also make a case that I think a, a, there's been a lot of sort of knowledge generated from artistic experiments with telematic art and real time communication. And so some of these examples, I think, demonstrate that as well. Um, OK, so I'll just jump in. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully that will go work smoothly. Which window do I want that one? Okay. Oh, hang on. I've got a few windows open, so I just need to get the right one. I want, actually, I think I want this window. Great. Okay. I think we're in business. So, um, yeah, so as I was saying, three parts. So the first part, yeah, is going to be sort of a lecture. The second part will be more of a, a demo. So we'll look at a couple of examples of using um, sockets in the context of like experimental chat apps. And then we'll conclude with like a conceptual prompt and a conceptual exercise to help you think about ways you might apply some of these ideas in your work, ways you might generate a uh, concept um, starting point for a project. Um, so I'll just jump into the, the sort of lecture material. Um, just also before I start, I will put a link. I prepared a GitHub repository for the workshop and I'll just share that link with you. Everything I'm doing is documented there. So if you know, if you want to just listen and not take notes, that's fine. If you want to take notes, that's fine. But yeah, it's there for you. 
Um, so, just getting everything sorted. I can't see the chat. Hang on, I think I have to stop sharing my screen to do this. Um, chat, okay, there we go. Yes, so here is the repository. Everything is linked from there. Um, does that work for everyone? Yes. Yes, thank you. Brilliant, excellent. Okay, and then we'll go back to sharing the screen. Great. All right. Okay, so brilliant. Um, I feel like I'm always feel like a DJ in these situations, but one that's sort of got too many things happening. Okay, so um, all right. So yeah, just a, a few more notes on who I am before we start. As um, as mentioned, you know, I think my main activities are artistic, um, but I do come from a background in engineering. So environmental engineering though. So I am sort of like self-taught in terms of like computer science and programming, but a lot of my work addresses questions of like, what are the inherent assumptions in technologies we use and develop? How might we think critically about some of these assumptions? Um, how might, yeah, how, how can artistic practice help us understand um, engineering and technological work in new ways. Um, and so my work, you know, it takes the form of, sometimes it takes the form of like large scale installation work, um, such as this project, Deep Swamp, which sort of considers the question of like, what does it mean to outsource decision-making about environments to AI and automated technologies? And so it takes the form of like large sort of installations consisting of wetlands and water and computers and so forth. Um, but then there's also a big part of my practice which exists, which is like an internet art sort of practice. Um, and so I sort of have these two and the two parts to my work and often try and bring them together. And a quick example is a project we recently did for the Whitney Museum, which consists of a sort of like, um, it's called New York Apartment and sort of a very artistic response to the insane real estate situation in New York City and the work scrapes every apartment listing in New York. So it scrapes all the online listings, all of the data we collect for the thousands of apartments for sale in New York and, and create this kind of um, giant uh, apartment listing from all of this data conglomerated, right? So it's this very... Um, surreal sort of overwhelming website <laughs> um but browser-based practice browser-based practice that's trying to push the limits of like what is a website and crit critique like what we expect from the internet in a way um so yeah feel free to explore or ask me questions about that at, at later um later on but today the focus is experimental chat as i mentioned um and I want to start by just looking at um, some examples of telematic art, some examples of sort of real time communication as artwork um, that will sort of situate us and situate this practice within a longer history. And so, um, again, this is documented on the, the, the GitHub. Um, and I'll also just say that a lot of this material I've developed and produced collaboratively with a collaborator of mine, Golan Levin, and we've written a book on um, computational art together. So this material is sort of coming from that publication that will be out next year if, if um, it's of interest. And so there's a few different uh, types of work that I want to introduce here. Um, and the first being uh, using like real time, um, real time technologies to sort of produce works of art that focus on experimental collaboration, this idea of 
um, persistence or collective memory in, in interactions, online interactions or digital interactions often? How do we, how do have artists created artworks where a sort of crowd or, or a lot of people online can contribute to something that ends up sort of being emergent um, and taking a life of its own? Um, and so in a lot of ways, these types of projects are what in English is called a can. And so I don't know if you've taken hikes or whatever, and you see these little piles of stones that, you know, many people over many, many years have sort of produced, everybody takes a walk, adds a stone to this thing, and you don't know who else has done it. And so there's sort of these co collaborative structures, right? that serve as landmarks, trail markers, memorials sometimes. And they really demonstrate this idea of like asynchronous collaboration that sort of emerges over a long time. And so this is sort of emblematic of this type of work for me. Um, a classic example of this is a project by Ken Goldberg um, and Joseph Santa Ramana and the project is called Telegarden, um, launched in the 90s, launched in the mid 90s. So again, like hard to emphasize like how difficult this would have been in the 90s. Like we're gonna implement some of these sorts of technologies in like 40 minutes today. And like, you know, this is sort of cutting edge computer science research in the 90s. Um, so again, I think we, we are at a moment where there's so much that we take for granted in terms of this sort of practice, but this, Project Telegarden, I don't know if you've come across it, it's very well known, but you may have. This was sort of a media art installation that consisted of a garden, and the garden could be manipulated with a robotic arm. And um, they published a sort of live feed of the gar garden on a website, and then people, users from around the world could um, log in remotely, and control the robotic arm to plant, water, monitor, and track the progress of seedlings and plants um, over the course of the project. And so there was this question in this work of like, in this situation, you know, would people care for it? Would someone come in and kill the whole thing? Like, how does this play out um, in a context where, yeah, like anything could happen, right? Um, I think it was moved to the Ars Electronica Museum. So perhaps some of you have seen it there. Um, but, you know, classic piece of like early telematic art um, that, yeah, again, also like, I think raises questions of care and codes of conduct, you know, I think we call this now as well in the context of social media. Another example is a project called Your World of Text. Um, this is by a Brooklyn based artist, Andrew Badir, and um, it's an infinite grid of editable text where like any change a visitor makes is visible by all other visitors. We can, if you click on the link, you can visit it. Um, so again, this is just like a giant, I guess, text based billboard in a way. Uh, one visits, you know, and you can leave messages that persist. Um, so every time one visits this, this project, it's different, right? Um, there's little messages, there's little images. Sometimes there's sort of collaborative um, drawing projects going on. Um, but this project again was uh, made maybe like, I haven't got a year here, but I think it was made probably about eight years ago. Um, and I think, I mean, I also think this work today looks a little bit different in the context of these sort of um, social media spaces that have no rules, right? And and as a result, like, yes, of course, sometimes when you go to a project like this, it's like full of racist comments or Nazi comments or whatever, because this is how the internet um, has sort of evolved in the, in the present day, right? Where uh, I think, yeah, like obviously the sort of utopian idea of like um, free communication and collaborative spaces has been shown to be, uh, problematic in many ways, right? For what sort of views that can be amplified in that sense. And so I think this question of like how much constraint one puts in one's work, uh, are there rules one in implements in projects such as this is like a critical 
question that, that you'll have to um, think carefully about. Um, but yes, an early example of a sort of collaborative shared text-based project is your world of text. Um, so also in this sort of idea of like collective memory, collaboration, um, I love this work, The Smaller Picture. The Smaller Picture 2002 um, by Kevin Davis is again a er very early example of a crowdsourced internet work. I think it still operates. Let's have a look. I'm, it's all of these works are so fragile, and like in the, even in the months of like, um, looking at them, you know, every few months when I go back and look at this archive, there's undoubtedly something has broken or doesn't work anymore. It's also in a good old uh, CGI extension that the, back in the days, like when you were relying on to Perl or some crazy obfuscating server language. So. Totally. Um, does, does, and like, it, does it work now that now they're not even going to support flash in these browsers anymore and it's like goodbye a whole like raft of internet art projects um so this just just I, it looks like it works so this project um you can see that you go to this website and the prompt is uh, we're trying to create a picture of a cat, but the only interaction I'm able to do here is I can either change one pixel. Oh, it asked me, should this pink pixel here be black or white? And so, you know, I, I can only make the tiniest decision in this sort of like collective effort to draw a photo, a picture of a cat. You can see the collective effort isn't going so well because the, the image of the cat hasn't really emerged. But we can make a decision here of whether the pixel should be black or white. What do you think? I think it should be white. Uh, I would say white. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll do white. Oh, and it keeps going. Okay, so he's we're drawing an apple. So that's getting closer to an apple. I guess it should be black. Um, and so this work in the first iteration of it, I think. Uh, for me, was a, was I, I really loved the first iteration of it, which is um, what the screenshot is taken of here. And rather than asking the crowd to sort of produce these um, images of cats or apples or whatever, um, the prompt was to produce a letter with the idea that it's this sort of collectively um, authored typeface. And so you can see here was uh, the attempt to create an A same method, you know, should this pixel be black or white? Um, and then after a period of time, uh, the artist produced an actual typeface from this sort of like massive collaborative effort. And you can sort of see a little screenshot of that um, typeface that was taken in 2004, so some time ago. But I think there's a real beautiful like poetry here, I guess, of uh, that troubles authorship, you know, it, there's no individual author here. Um, it is genuinely emergent, right? We can't really attribute a vision um, except for, yeah, these sort of tiny incremental decisions. And though I think this is a really beautiful example of um, a experiment in decision making and, and collectivity. Um, so when we're working with real time um, tech like, like like the sockets library. This is one, I think, very rich uh, ex area of exploration, right? How can you sort of produce a space or a context for to, to explore collective memory, collective intelligence? How does intelligence emerge when communication might be asynchronous or not existent? Um, how, what sort of rules do you put in place? How constrained do you make the action? So comparing the smaller picture to the Andrew Badir world of text, you know, in world of text, I can type anything, I can do anything. In the smaller picture example, all I can do is change one pixel, right? So there's a really interesting kind of like broad scope of what's possible in these two works. Um, all right, moving along, because I'm, I'm going to go over time, I know it already. So next body of work, the other sort of category of work that I want to mention is experiments in communication, right? So how do we think, how do we create projects that sort of trouble communication, subvert it, make us pay attention to um, different ways that we can communicate online? 
Um, this is work that I think really spans art and design. Um, obviously UX, you know, is very concerned with a lot of these questions now as a field as well. Um, okay, so 1980, Hole in Space, again, classic, classic project of telematic art. Um, called a communication sculpture by American artists Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinov, Rabinowitz. Um, and this was a project where they used a two-way video to connect a street um, storefront in Los Angeles with a storefront in New York City. So, I mean, the image is very small, unfortunately. I should have chosen a higher, um, higher res one, but you can sort of see in that very small image that there's a sort of like video projection in each window. And there's also a camera looking out at the street and the, the camera is sending the, the video link to the other site. So it's basically like Skype, the first version of Skype, I guess, in the 1980s. Again, we look at this now and you're like, yeah, you know, I do this every day on Zoom. We're doing it right now. What's the big deal? But this, you know, this was just, it's, I think it's just so hard to appreciate like the technical, um, uh, requirements of doing this in 1980 and also the imagination to to do like this sort of public intervention and like I love this image this second image I included here because you can see like people when this work was up would like organize with their relatives to the relatives in LA would go to the LA side and the New York side so that they could actually like see each other right and you can see like how excited these faces are and they're all like waving and trying to like see their friend on the other side of the country. Um, so again, I think, you know, this sort of puts into context like how recent a lot of this, a lot of these communication um, technologies are um, and how novel and special this, this would have been in the 1980s. Um, I think just the title as well, Hole in Space is just such a beautiful title for, for such a piece as well. And so these two artists did a lot of like these sort of network collaborations. Um, I encourage you to look at their work um, because they were just so early with this stuff, really amazing. So there's a number of other um, projects here. I'm gonna skip over some of them. You can again, explore them in your own time. They all link out to the, the artist's website. But I think Zach Gage is an interesting, um, he's actually an indie game maker. So his main jam is like making games, but he did this work as part of his master's um, work in, in at Parsons School of Design here. And this is a very standard chat app called Can We Talk? Um, and it's a program for like, that explores this idea of like, how do you design a chat app that conveys like how much attention someone is actually paying to what's going on? Um, if you have time later, again, I've linked from the image through to um, a description of the project on Vimeo, which I encourage you to look at. Um, but basically his chat app, um, the, the opacity of the text changes depending on whether the chat is the main window you're looking at. If there's a window in front of the chat window, then it fades out completely. If your mouse rolls over a different application, the opacity sort of like fades a little bit more. With this idea being that like, you know, chat's very freeing because you don't have to look at someone's face and you don't sort of have that cognitive burden of like sitting face to face with someone. Like, you know, the reduced form of communication in text gives a certain freedom, right? It, sometimes it's easier to, you know, talk about difficult things with someone on chat rather than to their face for this reason. But it's also ambiguity there, right? Where you don't know is, did someone not reply to my text because they're busy? Because they think what I said is weird, you know? Like there's a lot of ambiguity in that interaction. And so he was trying to sort of create a space that gave a little bit more information about, you know, is this person concentrating on this chat thing? Are they away? Like what's happening? And again, this work is, you know, almost 10 years old now. And some of the techniques he does put in to this project, we now see in like various apps, like uh, I think a lot of the, I can't remember which ones, but I think a lot of the sort of chat applications in Instagram and whatnot, you know, that it tells you if the person is typing or not typing or read the message or not read the message. So 
a lot of the ideas he's exploring here in 2011 have sort of been implemented in, in various UX approaches in, in apps that we all commonly use now. Um, so lots to explore there still, I think. Um, I think the question also of, yeah, like what you, how rich you decide to make a communication um, experience is still such a pertinent one, right? Um, okay, a couple of just, a, let's just run through a few more. So glitching communication, I think glitch remains a really like rich conceptual starting point when dealing with a project prompt such as this, because, um, you know, chat now is so ubiquitous that in order to sort of estrange it or produce an, uh, a project that might draw our attention to something that you know is every day glitch and and paying attention to where systems like bend or break is really a really rich um, conceptual uh, starting point and so um, Rosa Memkin writes about this beautifully like the centrality of glitch in a lot of media art practices in her glitch studies manifesto um, where she puts forward this idea that, you know, the noiseless channel is no more than a regrettable, ill-fated dogma, right? So this is a fantasy we need to let go of. Media artists, you know, tell us, have told us this for a long time. Um, and the manifesto goes on to define glitch as disintegration, such as the flip side of synthesis. You know, it's a positive disruptor in both art and culture. Um, so let's pay attention to these, to the particular potential you know of glitch and I think of course glitch also demonstrates the nature of every different platform we're using right glitches on Instagram appear very differently to glitches on zoom to glitches on Skype and they all provide little breadcrumbs or little hints of the underlying engineering in these systems as well right so they're 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 telling in a way and we become very attuned to them as well like um, Hito Steril writes about the sort of disintegration of images in memes and images that are shared a lot from, you know, people screenshotting over and over and over again, right? So the glitch kind of also produces this um, story about use and popularity and how much something is being shared, which I think is, is also very interesting. Um, okay, so some more examples of like telecommunication art that sort of relies on or like pays attention to glitch. 1923, you might be like, what is happening in 1923? The internet, you know, is, is, is 50, 70 years away or something. Um, but Hungarian constructivist artist, Lazno Maholny Nagy, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong, um, but it's early here. His work, Telephone Pictures, um, questions the idea of like the artist vision and the unique art object. And so Maholny had constructed um, artworks and the way he did the the way he produced his artworks, such as this image here, is he would call up a manufacturer and describe what the painting was supposed to look like over the phone, um, and then the manufacturer would, without seeing any mock-ups or images or anything, would then produce the work just from that phone call and that telephone description, right? And so there was this question of authorship here. There's this question of like errors in communication. So, you know, if I say a black line to the left, you know, how big is that black line? And so I think this is a beautiful example again of, you know, what gets left out in communication, how much is interpreted by the receiver as well as um, how accurate, you know, or the resolution of what, what is described. So I think this is a really beautiful example again of um, early sort of telematic art. Um, all right, a couple more. I, I just love all these projects. So <laughs> um, another example of an artist who, who has done experiments, and I think this project also thinks about interpretation and glitch is Miranda July. So she's a filmmaker in the US. And her app, Somebody, is an app that attempts to put humans in the loop of communication, right? So the idea is that, you know, if I want to send a message to, say, Gordon, maybe it's a difficult message, so I'm a bit worried about how he's going to react when he hears the news. 
Um, I could use this app theoretically to send a message and it goes out to the network and it says, you know, is anyone in Geneva in this neighborhood near Gordon, right? Who can go and tell him this message for me? Um, and so it sends the message to a nearby person on the network. And then the person has to go and find Gordon and explain whatever I'm trying to send him, right? So it's sort of like deliberately disrupting like automated communications by involving sort of a, a human messenger, if you like. Again, I think it's really lovely because uh, the premise, I guess, is that, you know, maybe it's easier to tell people certain news if it's coming from someone who can be like, are you okay? You know, you can check in on them or whatnot. And this sort of care or like level of sort of human interaction obviously doesn't exist if I just send Gordon the text message, for example. Um, I think Miranda July is a real genius because she takes, she, she realizes the work as the app so you can download it and use it as, as long as it's been maintained that's always a big question but she also um as a filmmaker puts a lot of work into sort of bringing scenarios or like playfully showing the sort of how the world that might um exist with this sort of technology so again there's a short film that she released with the work i again you can watch it in your own time that sort of theatrically played out, you know, a lot of these scenarios. Uh, so again, thinking about like how we document our work, how the power of storytelling around the work we're doing, I think she's a really good example of someone who's doing interesting, um, interesting work in that space. Um, and now just a final example of sort of deliberate glitch or paying attention to glitch. Uh, Lauren McCarthy, Carl McDonald, again, two US based artists, you've probably come across their work. Um, they do a lot of work around, yeah, like social technologies, the potential of technology to change our social interactions. Um, and this project called uh, Man Slash Woman in the Middle was a sort of six month performance that they, they did just between each other and set up a server and routed all of their text messages to each other through a server. And on the server, they wrote a bot program that sometimes would just send the text message through as is. And sometimes the bot would like make an adjustment to the text message. And sometimes the bot would send a message just on its own that appeared like it was coming from the other person, but it actually wasn't, right? It was this, this bot that they co-authored together. And so again, like they, they then lived with this um, this uh, intervention for, for a six month period. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I, I love this work because I, you know, I want to sort of try it, right? This question of like, how can introducing a sort of random actor in one's relationship maybe make you pay attention to it more, right? Like if I'm getting a message from my partner, but I'm not always sure if it's him or if it's a a bot that I've written, like it sort of would really make me pay so much more attention to his like personality and like if I can decode the difference. So I think this work is powerful for that like way that it acts on one's attention and like questions how much we really know each other and like, um, can we tell, you know, I think it also goes back to, you know, the age old Turing um, Turing test, which is like, you know, can one tell if it's if it's a computer or a person on the other side? Um, so yeah, I, a, a lovely example. And again, I think it's a lovely example of a telematic work, which isn't about like making a product that's going to be used by like thousands of people at scale, but a telematic work that's like uh, just between the two of them, right? So it's a performance that's uh, very kind of limited in scope. Um, which I think, you know, I think there's a lot of rich sort of potential there of like looking at sort of a more performance art uh, strategy here in combination with some of these technologies that addresses a sort of very personal um, space here. Uh, so again, take a look at the documentation. It's a lovely piece. Yeah. But what kind of modification the bot does like on the text? I can't read the, the images. That's a great question. I mean, the images are just like a very, 
a very a sort of normal conversation. I can read them to you. So, oh right. So one the phone on the left is Kyle's, and then the phone on the right is Lauren's. And so, you can see that Lauren sends to Kyle like my symptoms kind of match glaucoma. So they're talking about some like sickness that one of them has. <laughs> And then, so then Kyle actually writes back to her, okay, can you stop Googling your symptoms right now? But actually Lauren gets a message from the bot that says, I'm on it, where did you disappear to? Um, okay. And so then Lauren actually writes back to the bot saying, I'm in the bathroom looking at things on YouTube on my phone, ha ha ha, that's funny. But Kyle actually didn't say that. Um, so it's, I guess it's just inter interjecting additional comments in their sort of conversation around okay. their sickness. Like, like it's hiding messages and it's displaying others, but I thought it would change some text, like uh, it would understand the conversation, but it's, it's more like just replacing stuff. Okay. It's a good question. I'm not sure. You'll have to look into it a bit more. Yeah, I, I was just wondering uh, how does this work? So, yeah. To me, just looking at this image, it looks like it is just injecting new messages into their conversation. Yeah, I um, think there's also some sort of serendipity factor. So I guess like randomly it just like doesn't show a message which again like if you're communicating with someone i think it will create kind of weird yeah weird situations or like even like the fact that when you write ha 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 you know it has like a search and replace or something and it adds on something on top which again like makes the message completely yeah like bizarre ambivalent actually yeah mm. I, um, so I think you don't have to be very sophisticated in the way you yeah. gonna use the regular expressions or something. I think just the fact that you don't like that you don't send a response, send something completely arbitrary, it will already create some kind of weird effects. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I think there's obviously like the world of um, like natural language processing tools is developing quite fast. And so, you know, I, again, I think there's a lot you could do depending on just what toolkit you're looking at, right? So if you did want to do like analysis or like, you know, emotion analysis stuff, um, you could sort of create a version of this, is, which is quite different. It looks here like, to me like it's, it's fairly basic and it's sort of just injecting comments. But again, take a closer look because I'm not 100% I'm not sure exactly what, um, what they made possible in terms of like what the bot could do hmm. yeah it might yeah, be open source on their github they do open source a lot of their stuff so um you could take a look uh okay I, the last sort of uh crop of projects here i'll just ch choose one or two to talk about is this is a topic that i'm very interested in too is like this question of like bandwidth, right? And pushing against, I guess, a trajectory of the last, you know, century or whatever of these technologies, which is higher resolution, more information is better. Like, I think Zoom fatigue is very interesting phenomena here where, you know, you just get tired of looking at people's virtual faces and there is a real relief in not necessarily having visuals or not necessarily having all the visuals or like, reducing the amount of data that's exchanged. So this question of like bandwidth, I think is very, very key here as well. And so a couple of if projects just that sort of celebrate limits or constraints on uh, on these systems, David Horvitz, unfortunately this app I think is, I don't know if it still exists. It's definitely not on his website. I'm a bit sad that it's not better documented, but um, it was called The Space Between Us in 2015. And it's an iPhone app that um, just showed you the direction. So it's an iPhone app just to be used between two people. So you use it with a partner or a friend or a pair, um, someone else. And the only thing it tells you is the direction and the distance between you two. So as you can see in the image, um, you see this blue arrow and it just says, you know, they are three miles away, one mile away, whatever. Um, 
and you know there's again I think this is like there's a beautiful sort of intimacy and in not knowing more than that um, just really reducing down uh, what data is exchanged just to this sort of like two data points direction and distance um, yeah so so that's a very I guess reduced form of a communication um, device uh, what else? Another example, Die With Me, um, is a chat app. I think it, you can still get it and use it. And this is a chat app that you can only use when you have 5% or less battery on your phone. Um, and so you're sort of put in a chat room, I think, with other strangers. But all of you are also are, are all in this state of like having only 5% of batteries or less left on the phone. And I think there's sort of a question here, like, you know, in a sort of scarcity situation, like how does that change your interactions? How does that play out? Do you, does it sort of help you cut to the chase more? But I think the sort of energy use, energy consumption of a lot of these apps is something that we overlook. You know, digital technologies still port this like promise of like no limits and um, not being bound to material conditions and I, I think die with me very effectively reminds us that these things are pretty pretty fragile and pretty contingent on you know um, an energy regime that we take for granted often um, oh so many more okay I'm just going to skip over a few of these you can again look at them in your own time and so this last section exploring other intelligences so we've touched on this a little bit with the Kyle and Lauren introduction of a bot but I think there's a question of like, what other intelligences can we draw on in social spaces? You know, can we sort of reanimate uh, intelligences or histories, things that are lost to the past, intelligence of the crowd, or you know, what is what is sort of left out of digital media in a way? And so a couple of examples of this. Um, American artist is a really interesting American artist. He's, he's changed, his, he did the ultimate troll and changed his name to American artist right at the beginning of his career, which just means he's like impossible to Google, you know, because like you can't Google that phrase. Anyway, he's, he's, he's um, does a lot of work around racial politics in the US um, and so forth. And this is a chatbot that exists as an installation um, and it's a custom AI that's been trained on conversations from Sa Sandra Bland, um, who was an African American woman who died in police custody uh, here some years ago. And so the work uh, is dealing with uh, this person who is no longer with us, you know, it's dealing with uh, an AI trained on the words of someone who has died in this, in a, and is a victim of like the systemic racism that exists in the US. Um, so I think this is a really interesting example of this idea of like reanimating the past or bringing back um, or pointing to um, communicating, you know, with, with historic archives in a way, or, or chat as a way to sort of explore a, a historic archive or a archive of communication that may not um, of someone who may, you may not be able to talk to anymore. Um, I think machine learning is sort of interesting, opening up interesting possibilities for this type of sort of, you know, artistic pseudo historical work in a way. Um, and then finally, uh, let's see another Lauren McCarthy work, Social Turkers. So talking about other intelligences. So this project um, by Lauren ask the question, what if we could receive real time feedback on our social interactions? Would unbiased third party monitors be better suited to interpret situations and make decisions for parties involved? How might augmenting our experience help us be more aware of our relationships? And so what she does is she actually maybe I'll just show you the video because it's not very long. and I think it's good, but she creates a system that allows her to ask questions of people on Mechanical Turk. And she does this, so she goes on dates, internet dates with folks she's met online. And then she asks for real time feedback about what she should do on dates by asking Mechanical Turkers, right? So can the crowd or can a collective intelligence help um, 
help one date better, right? Help augment one's social interactions, uh, which is a question that she's obviously exploring a lot in her practice. Um, do we have time to sh show if I go for another five minutes? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. We, we have time, yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to share my screen again for the sound, aren't I? Okay, hang on a second. There's one checkbox you have to uh, The one checkbox. Check <laughs> Which is super hidden, actually. This it's on the bottom somewhere. <laughs> okay, share sure. computer sound. Let's try that again. Share. Yes. Okay. about uh, reality shows like oh, uh, yeah. yeah but like it's those kind of interactions that i find interesting but um yeah a bit weird at the same place, place like oh you're talking with someone but she's also not responding to you like what she's really thinking but yeah it's an extra layer so like, yeah really interesting Absolutely. And I think there's a big question of like consent here, right? And trust of like, when you're on a date with someone, yeah, you expect that they are not in contact with or not outsourcing their behavior to, to an external audience. Um, so I agree. I think, you know, I think this work occupies that sort of interesting space of like, oh, that is an interesting proposition, but it's also a little bit troubling and... Um... It, it makes me think I think about the parallel, like uh, when you are online, you can question to who, uh, whom are you talking to? Like if you're talking to someone, you are not sure that you are talking to this person. But in real life, if you are face to face to someone, you, you, you just assume that you are talking to this person. So, yeah, I don't know if we can find something to put in parallel to that, but maybe think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, um, again, you know, like the rules that one designs into, the, into a, a communication system, I think really impacts that, such as anonymity, you know, like, the decision of whether you enable people to be anonymous or not, whether you enable people to have to log in and, you know, be, um, uh, yeah, be held accountable to their communications in some way. I mean, we could think about the different websites out there and the different decisions made on those sites and what is produced by that, right? Um, 
Yeah, totally. And I mean, also the question of like agency, so where as we hear it's super exaggerated and amplified, you know, the way you're gonna, you know, through the means of technology, you're gonna react and date someone. But obviously, I mean, this happens also sometimes on a very subconscious level, like the, I don't know, you posted an image and people reacted to it and you feel somehow, you know, like change or in a way your behavior may might change in a very subtle, subtle way. And here this, I mean, it, it very much, I mean, it, 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 it looks a bit creepy and you think like, oh my God, like get closer or something, you know, when you get these instructions, like, I think also like you, almost like you outsource your agency, uh, which is an interesting thought experiment, I guess. And also, I mean, also the burden you have like in choosing to whom do you want to crowdsource? So I don't know if you if you would crowdsource to a fortune uh, community forum, um, you would get really nasty, oh, yeah. you know, like very quickly, very nasty yeah. uh, instructions. And so, yeah, and I, I mean, like I've been saying, I think so many of these projects are very of their time. And you know, this is like a project that was done seven years ago. And I think, you know, I agree, I think the internet has changed a lot or like, our understand like well my I'll talk from just from my perspective but like yeah if I was to see a student or, or a friend or someone who wanted to do this project now I'd be so concerned about them getting doxxed their like their safety because um yeah I mean we see how um interactions are sort of weaponized politically or harassment happens and I I think that is something that's, I don't know, very Trump era or like, you know, last sort of five or six years post Gamergate, I guess. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I guess there is a little bit of, uh, I don't know, productive naivety in this work or something like she, I think she's she was very brave in doing it in the first place. And then now I would be scared for her um which is sad i think like it's, it tells us a lot about where we're at in terms of oh, but it's um, yeah it's totally interesting to see these kind of references and to see how relevant they are still i mean even like when i think on like um in a, from a historic perspective like the performance art marina abramovich did like in the 70s where she just laid out like a couple of objects on the table and she invited the the participants to do whatever they want and she almost got killed because people got drunk and there were scissors they were cutting her hair so they did like really like crazy crazy things to her and it's like it's still very relevant this 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 work if you if you look at them as a from an as a as a reference uh, like as a reference point to see like why i mean how society also kind of not that it turned into this direction but it somehow changed and we had like yeah but we know that people are being intentionally manipulated and and to what an extent they also go on the street and don't hesitate to use their weapons because they just read that uh, in this pizzeria they're you know like uh, child pornography people but you know all is completely made up uh, driven by kind of trolls in the internet so so yeah i think i think it's uh, it's really interesting to see all these works even though they might have a couple of years it's still a uh, pretty relevant in the, in the, the way we, we we look at society and how communication technologies shape us absolutely yeah yeah um i and actually it's interesting i haven't asked lauren i would be interested to know if she did set sort of boundaries in terms of what she would and would not do you know and if there were requests made that she deliberately ignored because yeah like as we're saying i can i can easily see somebody asking or requesting that she do something that she would not be comfortable and i don't know what sort of yeah rule set she put in place in this work um yeah we should we should write her and find out she, but actually this project got iterated a few different, in a few different ways as well. Um, like I think she also made a version where rather than just texting, rather than communicating with mechanical turkers, uh, you could, you could listen in like as a friend onto her date and like um, give feedback that way. 
so that it wasn't sort of like anyone, but it was a, a group of people you could kind of nominate. So I think there's also, yeah, like different levels of openness um, possible in something like this. But again, you know, one of the things I really like about Lauren's work is, you know, she sort of does this like auto ethnography where she personally um, carries out the the project and and does the experiment on herself in a way and then sort of turns the do that documentation of her own experience into the piece um which i think is yeah a really nice nice approach here um okay so the last project i'll share is one of my own um which was a work i did in 2016 uh and it was called smell dating and i mean it's pretty self-explanatory but it was a dating service based on smell rather than like visual information and so we um launched this website um in 2016 and uh asked people to sign up to this dating service this is how it worked is like we People, I think the dating service, we ended up charging $25 for it because um, obviously that covered our like postage costs and whatnot, and also was a little bit of friction for participation. And so once you'd signed up, we would send out a t-shirt to you. You wear the shirt for three days. We ask you to not wear deodorant, but obviously it's sort of up to your discretion. And then you would send the shirt back to us um, after that, we cut every shirt into like 10 swatches, focusing on the areas of the shirt with the most information. So that's like this area. <laughs> and then you would get like, that's right, yep. Then you would get like 10 anonymous swatches of shirt sent back to you in the mail. Um, once you've received those 10 anonymous swatches, you got a like personal URL, which allowed you to rank uh, if you wanted to meet the person, if maybe you wanted to meet the person or it's a no, you had these three options. And then if there was a mutual match, so if it was like two yeses or a maybe yes, then our software just automatically put you in an email together and you would get an email saying congratulations, you know, you matched on smell dating. Um, and the people could then take that interaction wherever they wanted. So then that was the point where people set up dates and then went on dates. Um, and so this project really came out of like some thinking and work I was doing on data visualization and I was very interested in like exploring smell as a way of critiquing the sort of importance we and the weight we place on visual information online. So right, Tinder, all of these webs, all of these dating apps, like the profile picture is the most important thing. And obviously like that becomes a very, uh, gendered thing in that like you know the way that people curate their profile pictures tells you about class gender all sorts of like visual cues and that's how we'd like read and judge who we want to date women obviously get judged very differently to men and so like what would it mean like what gets left out of digital interfaces and to me like smell and like body odor and like how important smell is in attraction is just something that you only get to find out you know like thousands of text messages and, and several dates in probably. And so what if what if you could take make a judgment on smell right at the beginning and then after that make a decision? Um, and so yeah, we had it, the project was kind of crazy. We had hundreds of people signed up, it got a lot of press, I think, because it's an interesting question. We're all curious about, you know, how important femora, uh, um, pheromones and smell is in this equation. My apartment was full of dirty t-shirts. It, like, it was very, um, it was chaotic. <laughs> um, but, but it was really, it was really interesting. And a lot of people, like a few relationships came out of smell dating. And like, it, we also ran it once in Shanghai and it was really amazing. A few weeks ago, I got an email from two people who got married from the Shanghai smell dating. <laughs> um, Project. So we have a smell, a smell uh, marriage, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, I think so thinking about, yeah, like what gets left out? What don't we get to do when we're interacting through screens? Um, 
uh, is is also very like a very rich place to to start thinking about these things as well. And I think this project is also just a good example of like low tech. You know, I wanted to do smell work and I didn't have access to a lab. I didn't have like the really high e noses, the high tech equipment that one would need to analyze smell. And so we really tried to come up with a way that. Um, people could sort of dive into the question of significance of smell without having to build or like get access to a lot of technology. And so, you know, the, the website part of this was just a simple website that um, kept track of like who was in what group and like matched people's preferences based on their, what they entered. So it was just a simple database to, to track all that. Um, you know, so I think again, like how much you, you include offline is really important. Okay, I'll stop there. I know um, that has gone a little long, but lots of food for thought there. And I really encourage you to look at these examples in some more depth. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanna get to, I will stop sharing my screen for a second. We're just gonna so make we can... a round of uh, Zoom applause. So <laughs> unmute yourself, <laughs> show your video. And <laughs> thank you so much for for yeah for this great talk maybe we we do you we want to just wrap up if there were some questions be based on the your the personal works or uh, works that have been shown if not i would maybe just ask a little question <laughs> there's been a lot of uh, interaction in the chat yeah That's yeah important. exactly i i think oh, Tega, you you haven't seen it i but, haven't uh, seen it sorry you, yeah there, there there have been about yeah interesting discussions and admirations already during during your talk which <laughs> i like there were there yeah i liked uh, some some you had some really good punchlines like <laughs> like browser based practice or um when you talked about uh, the american artist um Oh, no, no when, you, when you talked about this chat in the face, like if you want to plunge into an artistic pseudo historical work, <laughs> or productive naivety. So there were there were a couple of really nice um, concepts and ideas. And uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, lots of food for thought. And what I really also what it made me aware is I think this kind of we have this, yeah, everyone is talking about Zoom fatigue and there is constant, everyone is kind of, I mean, we as a society, not only like, you know, we the tinkerers who anyhow touch uh, any new chat tool that we can get hand of, um, they have this feeling like, okay, yeah, we are sick of like instant communication. And there is this kind of almost like a movement starting of like slow computing or slow messaging. So, so the, the project you, you sh you've sh um, shown, um, now I, I forgot the title, um, the slow messenger where basically a person delivered the message to someone close oh. by from Miranda. Yeah. Um, I think the it was such a, such a perfect example and so much also again ahead of its time actually because I can totally see this uh, happening soon you know like actually you send a message and you know that it's going to take maybe a couple of days till the person gets it and you will really appreciate that effort like as much as people are still sending sometimes postcards or and stuff and they have like this kind of really nostalgic and uh, appre yeah this appreciation for for this kind of really really low bandwidth so i think there were like really nice and interesting starting points even like to uh, yeah even like new project ideas that you can just right away pick up from that content and develop that further in, in, in kind of contemporary times um so i i had one question regarding to the to smell dating how many serious demands did you get from dating apps like uh, did someone want to collaborate with you or like i don't know like from the big platforms uh i mean we did get a lot of people saying you know is this are you gonna like i think that we got a lot of traction because we we didn't present it as an art project like we presented it as a startup yeah. um and obviously that's just a format that i think everybody's really well versed in understanding that oh it's going to be subversive and there's an appetite for that type of presentation um so yeah i mean we did get like a lot of folks being like oh you know you're going to go for funding and you should scale this up and la 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 but i i also 
I mean, I think there was a question there for me of like, well, do I want to, what sort of work do I want to be doing? Like, do I want to run a dating service or do I want to like be an artist? Um, not that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, but I just, I'm also not convinced that like it can scale because like it actually involves so much physical labor. Like we set up this lab and had like a dozen friends who were working in it to like process all of the swatches and cutting shirts and packing them and mailing them. And so unlike a lot of like algorithmic dating services, um, you can't, we couldn't just like write software to, to cater for people. Like it, it create it, the, just the physical labor involved makes me skeptical of whether you could scale it up to like a nationwide service. I, I totally, I totally see the bottleneck of cutting and slicing white t-shirts into exact details and identifying the no, uh, sweaty parts. Uh, yeah, but like, it totally. So one it, person from an incubator was like, you just need to like have stickers which people put under their arms like don't do the t-shirts just do stickers and i was just like i just can't. yeah it, it it reminded me on my experience that i had with the web 2.0 suicide machine a project we did where we offered to kind of people to suicide themselves on social network and we got also contacted by a startup saying like yeah we really we really like your service and we should use it you know for people who die then we can kind of clean up their social network profiles and we were like oh my god no that's not what we're interested in we, we want to discuss like issues about privacy and what happens to your data when you put it on these platforms and and but it, the funny thing is also i had um, i had very much pleasure of looking into the press clips and you know how they talk about it in in tv it's just like i mean if that happens to your project it's like you yeah i think um, apart from the marriage part which you just told about in, in shanghai i think it's very gratifying also to see how how wrong media gets it and how much they believe like oh these are like a service and they take it so serious you know oh they're gonna charge 25 dollars they're really crazy and like, you're like Oh my god yeah we just made it up i mean it's like we you know you you start to play and like really hack uh, in a way media but again with a very low tech uh, approach and like basically just using words and uh, videos and and some web technology yeah yeah it is interesting like if i the the video clip is on on my website but we yeah we were on the ellen generous show we were on all like the daytime tv um talk shows and like the media narrative was the same in all of them, which they're like, oh, gross, smell dating. This is disgusting. And then someone would come in and be like, actually, I would try that. That's that's interesting. I love that. I, and then they have this conversation about, well, how important is smell? Um, and I think, you know, I think it's also like the way that humans interpret smell, like from a medical and physiological point of view is still like, controversial in science like there are a number of theories around like smell receptors and whether we detect molecule shape or like vibration or like the the jury's still out and so i think it also kind of just hits on like an ambiguity that exists in yeah in in medicine and science around around that and invites people to sort of try it themselves so like i participated and it was really amazing how sure you are whether you like someone's smell or not. Like I, the, it has this reputation of being subjective when in actual fact, you know, as you know, like you smell people all the time, you know who smells good to you and who doesn't. Like it's not something that's like you can control. Um, but where the subjectivity comes in is in the English language. There's not, it doesn't, there's no adjectives to describe smell. It's all done in metaphors through taste or like, you know, he smells spicy and it's like, that's, it's like, there's not a lot of, so the ambiguity is because we're bad at describing that sensation, um, which I think is fascinating too, right? Yeah, I was wondering, I'm looking at my uh, little son who is like two years and he has this, this plush toy and, you know, it's, he's taking it everywhere. So it, it has a certain smell. I mean, he's really bound to it. And uh, when you wash it, he's like, really, it's almost like he's not accepting it anymore. It's like, hey, you're giving me another thing. Like, it's not the thing I, I, I own, you know? So I think there is something very down to earth, like the way we associate smells. And I guess with growing up, we kind of, we kind of, we 
yeah, we are so much into visual cues and we kind of keep on forgetting this kind of, yeah, this our instincts or, or like, yeah, non-visual cues, I guess. It's not a, it's not a representation. It's not like, like image or sound where we can sort of re-represent and sort of synthesize the world in those forms. You know, it is literally like, pieces of that other object like lodging themselves in your body so there is this like i agree this sort of um truth to it or it's less hard it's less easy to manipulate and then of course like the history of perfume shows this attempt to like obfuscate or mask that sort of information but but then I think it's really interesting too that we don't talk about smell from a like from the language of information or data, right? Which was a big thing we were trying to do here too. Is like, you know, is is the information in the sample like like appealing to you, you know? Or trusting the body as a sensor um, rather than trying to outsource it. Nice. Any any other questions or remarks um, from trusting the body as a sensor? Awesome sentence, <laughs> live from the chat. <laughs> we yeah, it's very funny. I mean, what I've noticed in when you're at conferences or something, there is this kind of meta level going on on Twitter, or like people discussing. And I think on Zoom, it's now the chat also because sometimes we had juries where students were presenting the works and out of a sudden in the chat window like the tutors they were all going crazy like yeah this could be like this and kind of this kind of parallel world build up so i think this also <laughs> worked totally and applied to your to your talk and i would like to thank you again and maybe we're gonna just make a short break of like 10 minutes and we're gonna start with the hands-on part is that okay for you so we can all grab a glass of water and um yeah inhale and exhale and <laughs> yeah i think this inception idea it kind of stuck to me now with the small particles flying around so i think we're gonna everyone I should mean, open your windows and yeah bring in some fresh air